want to welcome you to our service here at Corner Brook Baptist Church, here in person or joining us online. We're glad that you're able to be here this morning. We've had a good weekend with our conference with Dr. Harry Gardner, and we're looking forward to him sharing with us in a little bit. As we begin, I would like to read a few verses of Scripture from Psalm 104. The Lord, and think of the description here of who God is. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beam of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He sets the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows when to go down. How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Lord, we gather here <clears throat> uh, to, to praise you, to worship you. We know that you stretched out the heavens. You control the clouds. You set the earth on its foundations. You make the grass to grow. You give, uh, you give us food to eat. You give us the seasons. And your works are wonderful. There's so many we could, we will be all of eternity exploring your works and who you are. And so as we gather here this morning, I pray that you'll help us to turn our attention to you, to give over to you the things that we're carrying, the burdens that we're carrying. And Lord, maybe we have things on our hearts, our minds that feel overwhelming. And I pray that in some way you will speak to that and, and lift our eyes up to you. So guide in all that is done today, and I pray this in your name. Amen. Oh, 
When David neared the end of his life, he said this, But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. When we give back to God in our offering, he gave it to us first. And he gives us all things. And the song we just heard certainly described the the many spiritual blessings that God gives to us. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. And the plates will be passed for our morning offering. We pass these plates as an act of worship. And we want to say that if you're a guest today, we do not want you to feel obligated to give. But if you do, we welcome it as a gift to the work of God. And while the offering is being taken, um, just a couple things I will point out in your bulletin of events happening. We have youth group tonight, youth connection group tonight at Pastor Dan's. And of course, you know that means food, right? We have a knitting group beginning tomorrow here at the church in the morning, Monday morning at 1030. We have another ladies connection group. Tuesday, 7.30 here at the church. Kathy is having a scripture reading at her house Friday night, this coming Friday at 7.30. And the address is there in your bulletin. And also, if you have started to attend our church in the past few months, we have a special treat for you. We want to have lunch with you next Sunday. We have a Meet the Pastor's Lunch right after the service. And if you said, if you started attending and you have not attended one of our Meet the Pastor's Lunch, uh, we would love to have you join us. Just uh, send us a note at info at Cornerbrook Baptist or just show up. There will be food. So. Well, let's pray. God, 
You are the God of all grace. No matter how much we give, we could never outgive you. As we give to you our financial gifts, we also pray that you'll help us to use the spiritual gifts that you have given to us. You give to us so that we can share with others to serve you and to serve your church and to build up your church. So we are blessed to serve you financially and to serve you through, through our time, our talent, and our treasures. And may you bless the work of our hands. And I pray this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> um, Dan wanted to say... Something about the Trunk or Treat event. Oh, wait, wait, one more announcement. Robert Barbeau, do you want to stand just for a minute? Robert is starting a couple of men's groups, small connection groups. Uh, one is in the evening. One is in the morning. You can have your choice. Today is the deadline. If you want to join uh, the men's group, please see Robert today. So, Dan, you want to mention the Trunk or Treat? All right, good morning, everyone. Those of you who are visiting, my name is Pastor Dan, I'm the associate pastor here, and I, I put up with this guy, making fun of me all the time. I never give it back to him, I'm, but he, uh, anyway, pray for me. Uh, just have a, uh, just want to do a quick announcement. Last fall, one of the highlights of our fall season, fall ministry season, was our trunk or treat uh, event that we had out here in the parking lot. And we had over... Um, a, I, rem- I know it was over 100 uh, kids who came through, and, and uh, the point of, of having an event like that is to really just uh, uh, build relationships in the community and give people uh, sort of an open door and, and uh, introduce them to our church and what happens here. And so we are, uh, we're excited to be doing that again this year. And so what we're looking for are a couple things. We're looking for uh, donations of candy. Uh, Last year we had, uh, you guys were very generous, and so we're hoping that uh, as you pick up candy for your own houses, you would pick up a bag or two and drop it off. No bubble gum, please. That tends to get left in my office and turns really hard, and that's just... Um, so don't... <laughs> anything other than bubble gum. Uh, also, we are looking for people who would come and just open your trunk. And uh, the way it works, the kids come in, families come in, there's some hot chocolate there, and they can work their way around to all the different cars and get, uh, uh, get candy at each of the little stations there. So if you would like to come and be a part of the actual event that evening, let me know. Uh, and at the very least, pray for the event and, pr- and uh, donate some candy to it. Thank you. Oh, you've got to stay up here. I'm not done with you yet. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> last week I had <laughs> I had the privilege of attending the Board of Ministerial Standards meeting. Oh my goodness. And <clears throat> which interviews candidates for ordination. There's a certain name that came up, Mr. Dan Bercy. I got kicked out of the room though. So, just to let you know a little bit of the background, Pastor Dan came here from uh, the Pentecostals Assemblies of Newfoundland, so he was preordained before he came. And so this was a matter of preordained, yeah. I am Baptist. (laughs) And so this was a matter of the board interviewing him, examining his credentials, and just hearing his testimony and so on. And it, it's a process of recognizing prior ordination. And I got kicked out of the room when they did the final vote, so sorry, I couldn't say anything. I wanted to say a lot, but they didn't let me. <laughs> but uh, I was only out like 30 seconds, and they, I, they called me back in, and it was a 100% thumbs up. <clears throat> So in this envelope, Dan, is your ordination certificate awesome. wow. from, from the Canadian Baptist of Atlantic Canada. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Don't let that go to your head, though. <laughs> 
Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll we're going to go to prayer time. to head downstairs and I'm going to invite Reverend Dr. Harry Gardner
Uh, you have been involved in so many things that it would take a long time, but let's just say you have been very active in churches in our Baptist family, was president of the Canadian Baptists of Atlantic Canada for a while, president of Acadia Divinity College, and currently, I'm trying, you are? Oh my, at the Canadian Baptist National Convener. Okay, so it is a position that helps our Baptist family across Canada to do things together. Mm, that's, that's layman's terms? That's, that's, that's good. good, okay. But, but we are glad. How many years has it been since you've been in Newfoundland? Uh, eight. Eight years, okay. So we are glad that you're here with this morning, and may our prayer is, is that you will feel free to share what God has laid on your heart. Thank you, friend. Appreciate it very much. Well, good morning. Some of us have been gathering since Friday evening uh, to think about spiritual formation, our own walk with the Lord, and the implications of how Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, works in our minds, our hearts, our whole life to form us into Christ. But before I get into all of that, I want to thank the pastors, and congratulations to Dan on your full acceptance uh, as a ordained pastor in the Canadian Baptist of Atlantic Canada. That's a wonderful recognition and wonderful for you uh, to be able to present that to him this morning. And I love what I see happening in the duo um, in terms of that. And uh, Gail and I, through the many years of our uh, ministry, have been privileged to be in and out of various churches. Um, we get a sense when we come into a place of ease or maybe unease, there's a lot of ease here, and we love that. And we recognize God at work in this place, and you will be in our prayers. It was about eight years ago that we were here on Easter Sunday. We'd been here for a couple of days that time as well, and got to know some of you. And even before that, years ago, when I worked with the home mission board of our Baptist Convention, I was privileged to come into various association meetings and get to know some of you through the years. I want to bring you greetings today on behalf of Acadia Divinity College, which is our seminary here in Atlantic Canada, and our president, Dr. Anna Robbins, uh, to bring her greetings and that of the faculty and the staff. And I believe that there will come a day, perhaps, when one of the faculty may be able to join you at some point, and one of the other retired faculty member you mentioned as well may be able to come. So we're grateful. I've got that hat on this morning among a few others, but really I'm just here as a brother in Christ to share the word of God with you this morning that we might break this bread together and be nourished by it and challenged by it. Uh, this particular text that I'm going to share is one that God's been working in my heart. Through my years I've been passionate for people to come to know Jesus. That's the heartbeat that I have in my life is that people will come to know him because he said, I've come that you may have life and that you might have it to abundance. And there are lots of arguments among Christians about this and about that and something else. My focus has always been trying to bring everything back to Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to look at a text and we're going to be challenged by the Lord, I have no doubt, because this passage really challenges me. Let's pray together and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us today. Lord, you're present with us. We thank you for the worship experience we've had already in your house of worship today. And as we've come, we know that some are carrying heavy burdens and others are very lighthearted and glad. And we pray that in the midst of whatever is happening in our lives, that you would allow us to have an open heart and an open mind to hear from you. So open your word to us. Nourish us through your word today. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to turn to the Gospel of Luke and invite you, if you have your Bible, to join me. I'm going to read what the notation in my Bible calls it, the parable of the Good Samaritan. I should say, however, there's no doubt the Samaritan was good, but he's never designated as good in the Scriptures. Interesting just should probably be the parable of the Samaritan. Here we go. I'm reading from the New International Version. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, 
he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do Likewise, I have a question for you as a church this morning, and that is, where is the inn? And specifically, where is the inn in this beautiful place called Cornerbrook? Back a, a few months ago, I was part of a retreat, and as we practiced some of these disciplines last evening, we began to think about some spiritual practices. As part of the retreat, we were to go off by ourselves and we were to either take a walk and just notice our surroundings and see God in nature perhaps, or reflect or pray. And I decided, because there was a beautiful park beside this church where we were, in fact, we were meeting at New Minus Baptist Church in the Annapolis Valley where Gail and I live not far from there. And uh, there's a, a park by the name of Lockhart Ryan Memorial Park. Now, I want you to listen to the description of this beautiful park where I took a walk. Today, the park houses a splash pad, three soccer fields, Lockhart Ryan's number one, two, three, and four, beach volleyball courts, uh, Miller ball field, mini soccer pitch, maintenance building, tennis courts, basketball court, playground, picnic area, so on, so on, trail systems, club hose, upper ball field. I go on. I could go on and on. If you go on in the website, you'll talk, it'll talk to you about, or you can read about cyclocross biking. I don't know what that is. I don't know what some of these things are. But as I read, I thought, wow, what a place in my own backyard. I didn't know anything about this. So as I walked along, I was seeing the trees. I was listening to the birds. I think, I'm doing well, Lord. You're in this place. And then came my surprise to see, hmm, this sign that said, do not do this here in this park. You cannot walk your dog without a leash. And it went on and on. And the further I walked, I thought, oh, oh, oh. There were so many do nots that I began to think, well, how do I do in this place? And I realized now, I want to say to you, then involved in Parks Canada, I worked for a while for, with Parks Canada. I want you to understand, I understand why there can be restrictions. But I want to tell you, because <laughs> all these don't do signs really began to depress me as I began to look around in this beautiful place. And I realized there's a reason why there had to be signage. Okay, I, I get it. My point is, the beautiful place, somehow, some of it, was taken away by all these things that I couldn't do, all these restrictions. Restriction, 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 even though I understood the need for some restrictions. 
There was a man by the side of the road in the ditch. He was left there beaten, bruised, bloodied, stripped of whatever belongings he had, and he had a sign over him. It was invisible. The sign was, do not touch. So the priest walked by. There were religious restrictions. You cannot touch, especially if that could be a dead body. Do not go near. Don't even check and see if he's breathing, by the way. And after all, why would somebody be by themselves on that road between Jericho and Jerusalem? It's a really bad road. Shame on him for being by himself. He should have known better. There are thieves on this road, signs over the man. Just leave him alone. Then came an imposter on the site, a Samaritan, not a Jewish person, but a hated Samaritan. And by the way, remember, the question that Jesus is trying to answer, because there's a, there's a story he's telling, but the question was, because this leader, this one expert in the law, religious people can be experts in the law, stood up to test Jesus. They love to test Jesus. He says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? It's on your mind. How are you getting in if there's an in to get? How do you cross the line to get into heaven? How, how are we going to make it? If there is such a place. For some of you, that's your thoughts. So Jesus reverses it to the man, this expert in the law, and he says, well, how do you understand what is written in the law? So Jesus turned it right back on him, and the man began to recite a passage of Scripture that will be good for us to understand. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Ah, then came, then came the uh, question. Who is my neighbor? And the story began to unfold, but Jesus didn't answer the question. He didn't answer the question. The question was, who's my neighbor? The question really Jesus answers is, who can I be a neighbor to? Who can I be a neighbor to? But that person in the ditch needed a neighbor. The person in the ditch represents the people in our lives, in our church family perhaps, outside this beautiful community, where we ask ourselves, who can we be a neighbor to? I see the church as a wonderful community of faith, a place of prayer, support, place of worship, a place of learning, outreach, rich but biblical study, a place of mission. In some ways, I see the church as that beautiful park I was walking through. At first glance, it looks just beautiful. But then, sometimes, there are the invisible signs. The signs that sometimes say, well, you can come in under certain circumstances. Now, we don't write the, the invisible rules on the walls. We don't put them up here. Are there restrictions here? I don't, know, I don't know you. I would ask this of any church I was preaching in. The hardest door to get through for the people outside this morning in Cornerbrook is that front door. The hardest door 
It doesn't matter how friendly we are. It's so hard for people to find their way into church. Where is the inn in Cornerbrook? You see, loving God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind cannot be separated or divorced from loving our neighbor as ourselves. You say, well, I love God. I want to love God. I want to worship him. I want to serve him. We cannot do that without loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. What I learned from this passage of scripture is the first priority for Jesus, it's always people. In fact, Jesus was a real rule breaker, a law breaker. He loved to heal people on Sundays, and I think he loved it to get attention. He tried to show people that the law was created for people, not the other way around. That doesn't mean that the law is insignificant. It means that people come first, always. I remember in our home, when our children were growing up, I remember our daughter having an 18th birthday, and she was hoping that I wasn't going to tell the story of her birth when we came to the cake and all her friends were around, and I wasn't going to tell how her mom was sick and how the doctor went through a terrible snowstorm to get there. I love to tell those stories to the kids. <laughs> yeah, when they're little, they like that, but when they get older, not so much. But one of the boys in that class, uh, an 18-year-old, he was saying to me, he knew I was a pastor, he said, yeah, I don't believe in God, I don't believe any of that, I, yeah, 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 I don't believe it. Then they went downstairs to the rec room, and he made his way back upstairs, and he came to me and he said, I'm reading the Gospel of John. Oh, I said, tell me more. He said, I want to know about Jesus, but I don't want anybody to know that I want to know about Jesus. And that began a conversation with that teenager. But he, in a way, was feeling outside of it all. I see the neighbor who lived down the street from us in Kentville, an elderly man who lost his wife and then his only son within months of each other, and he had to move. That man needed a neighbor. I see newcomers to Canada. Everywhere that we look, we see newcomers to Canada. Newcomers to Canada need a neighbor. They're disoriented coming into our beautiful country. They need people to be patient with them with language. They need people to take them by the hand and show them. I see the homeless in the streets of our town of Kentville, many of them with invisible signs over them, and the sign reads, have mercy on me. I see a supervisor at the Irving plant in St. John who on a Sunday morning as he's going to work inexplicably, he can't explain it. He said, I had this great desire welling up in me, go to church. And he left, uh, he spoke to Mr. Irving, he said, you don't go into Mr. Irving's office and say, I'm, I'm, I need to leave. You wait for Mr. Irving to tell you when you're going to leave. He said, I began to say to him, I need to leave. And Mr. Irving said, okay, but where are you going? He said, um, well, um, I'm, 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 I have to go home. He said, I didn't tell him I was going to church. And that man came to church. And the morning that he came, we had someone preaching. And he gave a powerful message. And that man came forward to give his life to Christ. But he felt like an outsider in our church. And it took him a while to learn the language of the church. We, he needed a neighbor. I see the woman of our town in Liverpool, when we were the pastor on Liverpool, Nova Scotia, the beautiful South Shore. I see the, the chairperson of our deacon's board, his wife, on a Sunday morning, brought in someone from the town that we might describe maybe as a woman of the street. There was a sign over her head that everybody had recognized her. And you know, it was almost church time. And as this woman brought her friend in, and they came, they had to sit because all good Baptists don't they sit in the back? Well, anyway, they had to bring her almost to the front, and as they did, there was a collective asthma attack. <gasps> oh. You know what? That woman didn't bring her back anymore. Took her over to the Salvation Army because there were no signs like that there. You see, the man in the ditch who's half dead, he needed a neighbor. And he had a lot of invisible signs over his head, a lot of opportunity for judgment. As I said before, nobody should be on that road between Jericho and Jerusalem alone. But he was, 
and he was taken advantage of, and he was beaten. And the Samaritan comes along. That's the thing. The surprise of this story is it wasn't a Jewish person who rescued the Jewish person. It was the hated Samaritan who becomes the hero of this story. And that is the punchline of this whole thing. The surprise to the expert in the law, he has to admit that it's the Samaritan who is actually the hero of the story. But that man who took mercy on him, had compassion on him, he did what he could. The scripture tells us he put the man on his own donkey, he dresses his wounds, he takes care of him, but then what does he do? He takes him to an inn. Why do you suppose the man took him to that particular inn? You might say, well, it might be the only inn in the place. That's possible. We don't know. I think he took him to the inn because he might have known the inn keeper. And not only does he go to the inn, not only does he take him to the inn, he says, take care of him, and he tells him what to do. He says, and I will repay you when I return. So there is at times a personal response to those who we meet. By the way, let me just say, we cannot take on the world. We cannot take on everybody. Don't feel that way. I'm not trying to guilt anybody into anything. All I'm trying to say to you this morning is there are people who are along our pathway who are in the ditch. And we're simply called to do what we can, but we bring them to an inn. I can only minister to a woman who's lost her husband in a certain way, but there are people at the inn, if I bring her, who also are women who've lost their husband. And when that, those women look at each other, they can say, I understand, in a way that I can't. And healing can come as prayer comes. There are newcomers, I see newcomers, people from all over the earth who are coming into Cornerbrook as they are coming into our nation. And as they come, they need people like us to help them, understand them, and value them and their experience. We do what we can do, and we bring people to an inn. It requires of us, though, not only just a plan, but it does require a price. This particular Samaritan says, I will repay you for whatever it is it's going to cost to do this. Yesterday morning, as part of our time together, your lead pastor shared a vision statement that the church leadership and deacons have been working on. And one of the value statements is in the whole area of hospitality. I loved it. I loved it when you sent it to me, and I loved it when I heard it yesterday. It's a vision that will permeate, and you will think about this as a church. Listen to the words of your leaders as I share them again. These are the words of your pastoral team and your deacons team about yourself. These are not my words. This is what was shared with you yesterday. They come out of your leadership. Do you understand where I'm coming from right now? These are the words of your church for a vision of hospitality. Listen to this. We see a church where the sound of laughter breaks down the walls of silence where people move from the loneliness of isolation to the joy of healthy relationships, where the hurting, the depressed, the frustrated, and the confused can find love, acceptance, help, hope, forgiveness, guidance, and encouragement, and where we welcome all people, regardless of race, sex, or history, into our family, just as God has welcomed believers into his family by his grace. We extend radiant hospitality. We will strive to create a non-threatening environment so that those who are not committed to Christ are free to explore the Christian faith at their own pace. We will look for ways to show hospitality, whether inviting newcomers and guests to have lunch with the pastors. We heard about that this morning. Having meals together as a church. We experienced that yesterday. Or providing coffee refreshments. 
We will intentionally reach out to our international community at our universities, colleges, larger community by providing meals or other forms of hospitality. We will emphasize the need to care for one another and develop methods so that no one falls through the cracks and is overlooked. Wow, I was excited when I read that. Because I am persuaded, you remember how I said my heart beats for people to come to know Jesus? I am fully persuaded that the best way that we will ever do our work as a church to fulfill the Great Commission to make disciples of all the nations, our job is to make disciples for Jesus. We will do it when we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbor as ourselves. And we will genuinely love our neighbor. When we were serving at Liverpool as a pastoral team would get together with other pastors of other churches at Christmas time. I don't know if you do this or not, but we had this thing called Christmas boxes. And we would deliver these beautiful Christmas boxes with a turkey in each one. And it was something the whole town did for those who didn't have such things. And we were gathering to do this. And one of the leaders of our church says, blah, 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 blah. I, I don't know why we're doing this. I don't, I don't know if any of these people will ever come to church. I said, we aren't doing this for, we aren't doing this for that. We are doing this for this. We are simply giving a gift without any strings attached. We're just loving people because that is what the Lord told us to do. We're not going to judge people because the Lord told us not to judge them. We're not going to put strings on anything we're going to do. We're just going to do it because this is what the Lord told us to do. If they come to know Jesus, hallelujah. If we love them in a way that draws them in, and I think it will, genuine love, people can recognize that. It provides opportunity for conversation. In other words, there was a day in the past when we'd ring our bell or open our door and people would come in. That's gone forever. We've got to go to them. And we got to earn the right to ever speak into their lives. There was a day when we thought we could start by speaking about the gospel. Some of you are gifted in that manner. That's wonderful. I will say to you, we need to earn the right to be able to have a hearing by our lips, by our lives before we ever get to our lips. That's the day we're living in. And it's a good day. Don't ever despair and say, oh, I remember the days when the churches were full and the people would come and my goodness, and there's nobody. Listen, the Holy Spirit of God is at work drawing people to himself and we get to participate in that journey. Where's the inn in Cornerbrook? We've been here since Friday. I know this is a good inn. You've got good innkeepers. And not only in your pastoral team, in the deacons, the leadership, the people who have been part of this church for years have demonstrated we care in this place. Are we perfect? No, we're not ever having to be perfect. But we're called to have integrity. When we mess up, we say, we messed up on that. When we didn't get it right, we say, sorry. That was not the way we ever intend to do things. But this is our calling, to be an inn, to be a place of healing. And remember something about healing. And I've met some of you who are in the medical field and world. You know that when there's an injury, it doesn't heal normally overnight, does it? No. It takes sometimes a long time for healing to come. In our own family these days, we're, we are trying to come alongside two women in our families. My wife, her brother passed away and she has a sister-in-law who's dealing with the loss of her husband. In my family, my brother passed away and we've been trying to come alongside my sister-in-law in that. We know that healing takes time. Grief work takes time. We know that in our work and ministries, Everything isn't going to happen immediately. It takes time. Friends, all I would encourage you to do in your desire for people to come to know Jesus is demonstrate his love, pray for them, don't try to do it all yourself as an individual,
bring them into an inn, the body of Christ, where other people can minister and serve the Lord together. I'm persuaded as we go home, we will be telling people about our time in Cornerbrook, and we'll be saying, we found an inn in Cornerbrook. And we will promise that we will continue to pray for you in your ministry here in this beautiful, beautiful place. May the Lord bless you. Let's pray together. Lord, um, you are the one, really, who's the healer. And you're the one who left it all and came to us. You're the one that sacrificed. You're the one that died on the cross that we might have our sins forgiven, but you're also the one who's promised us new life. And I pray today, Lord, if there are people who are here who don't know you, they are wondering about you, they're like that teenager who might be just inquiring, trying to get to know you, I pray that you'll draw them in. I pray today that the wounded and the hurting who may be among us would know that you're the healer. We're not the healer, but you are. We can be agents of healing, but you're the healer. Help us to be that to others. Give us patience to wait for healing to come. And turn us into those who would be happy to help even those who we find along the ditches who've lost their way. Guide us and lead us, we pray. And I thank you for this beautiful inn, this church family. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.
want to remind you that we've got lots of food downstairs. So whether you were able to be here earlier in the week or not, that doesn't matter. We'd love for you to join us, um, even if you weren't able to bring something. I saw some big pots go through. I think there's lots. So please, you're welcome. Um, I just want to close our time with a couple of verses that uh, Dr. Gardner shared with us during one of our sessions. Colossians chapter 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. May the Lord bless you as you leave here this week.